Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to Lightning Talks. We have currently three Lightning Talk sessions. That is Tim Potter talking about open source as a moral duty, um, Ya talking about contributing to a community with open source, and Jeremy talking about saving babies with Debian. Um, as always, uh, it's still possible to sign up or you know, just run up to me and say, yes, I want to do a Lightning Talk. Please do. Um, and I'll be accepting late nominations up until pretty much we finish. We have 40 minutes, and I'll see you soon. from Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and this is my very first lightning talk ever. Uh, in the next five minutes, I'm going to try and convince you, uh, I'm going to try and show you why writing open source is a moral duty and everyone should be doing it. I'm going to try and do that by considering the question, uh, did the ancient Romans invent open source? Well, uh, obviously not, that's, you know, that's just clickbait to get your attention. Uh, they didn't have any electricity, and as the joke goes, there's no way to represent the number zero using Roman numerals. <laughs> Instead, I think that 2,000 years ago, uh, Roman and Greek philosophers developed a, uh, some principles that underlie what we all do today. So this is uh, Marcus Cicero, uh, Roman lawyer, orator, and open source, no, and philosopher, born in 105 BC. He wrote a book called On Duties, which is a guide to uh, ob uh, conduct, obligations, and decision-making, uh, which is it's actually a, a lot less boring than it sounds. And it's been called the very first self-help book in history. So in defining moral goodness, uh, Cicero says that it originates from protecting and developing society uh, while still observing everyone's rights. And we can see some parallels here with open source already, right? It's not a big stretch to say that open source has you know, benefited society in many ways. And we've explicitly uh, put it in writing kind of the rights and obligations of uh, people in our social contract and um, the open source definition. And of course, we try our best to live up to them. And the word counterpart here is interesting. We've got the non-free section in the Debian archive. And uh, our non-free friends in the proprietary software world are uh, most welcome and enjoy the same rights as we do. Uh, Cicero also says that it's a moral duty that we should make everyone better uh, by working for the common good, giving and receiving freely, and sharing what we know with the world. So deploying knowledge is an interesting phrase here, I think. So Cicero's book was written in Latin, and it's a bit hard to know uh, what his original intent was with that. But it's safe to say that Debian uh, has deployed a huge amount of knowledge uh, in the, for the world to use. So it's over 40,000 packages uh, are available for anyone to freely download, use, and modify as part of the Debian system. And uh, yet, of all social bonds, none is more excellent and more enduring than when good men or women of similar ways are joined together in the spirit of familiarity. And if that doesn't describe the Debian, Debian and the open source community, then I don't know what does. And I'd like to finish with a single sentence uh, from the About page on the Debian website. Debbie uh, Bedell pointed this out on Sunday in the panel talk, uh, and he described it. He, mentioned it as an elegant and succinct way of describing the Debian project. And I think this fits very nicely uh, with Cicero's 2,000-year-old ideas of duty, obligations, and how to make the world a better place. Thanks.
Okay, next up is Yadufi. Where may she be? Hi. <laughs> Talking about helping her community. Okay, um, I'm Yadufi and I'm from Ghana and Africa. Ghana is over there, the blue side. And this is Ghana and I'm from the Ashanti area, the middle part. And in Ghana, we don't have a lot of um, IT stuff going on. We don't, actually it was my first time hearing about Debian and it excited me to come and know more. Just a brief introduction about Ghana. Yeah, you can check it online. So this is the state of force in Ghana. We, there was a survey and realized Windows is over 84.7, 84, 84 Linux 11.9, and the US 3.4. And the main reason for the OS dominating was because most desktops came with it pre-installed. And also, the other reasons were the availability of um, support and technical support and uh, Applications were cool, but most of these um, windows are not legally licensed. Okay, so some of the challenges for why there's not enough usage of force in Ghana is for the cause of the absence of force in Ghana, and the procurement policy does not clearly stipulate terms for procuring a software. Actually, the Public Procurement Act 2003 defines a software as something you buy a license for, which basically means we don't consider force in Ghana. Um, so, and many users still have the perception that force solutions are complex and um, there's lack of force solutions in Ghana. People, there are not enough people who have um, technical support for people who have challenges using open source and people complain of too frequent updates on many OS types. Okay, so according to the UN Sustainable Development Goal, we want to promote um, policies that support productive activities, decent job creation, entrepreneurship, creativity and innovation, and also encourage the growth of micro, small and medium enterprises, including um, access to financial service. So if also attaining higher productivity, economic productivity. In Ghana, uh, we are in economic crisis now. We have a lot of people in force not paying so much money for proprietary software. Then we could get money to help other parts of productivity in Ghana. Also, upgrading and innovation and all that. So, the way forward for force, my role. Um, a lot of people in Ghana don't have personal laptops or desktops. So if we get the public interest to um, open forums and for example, for an internet cafe that has 10 computers and is serving like 200 people in a day, if you have 200 people using a machine or the internet cafe that has free open software installed, then at the end of the day, we have 200 people that are enlightened on 
open software, and that could help a lot. And as passionate about empowering women in IT, because in Ghana, it's very low. Women are afraid to endeavor the IT um, section. So I volunteer with Elite Global, that's emerging leaders in technology and engineering. And they come to Ghana every summer to organize um, STEM field programs for girls, where we train them in Arduino, Python, and yeah, that's also open, open source. So I'm very passionate about that. I want to contribute to that also. And I want to also help marginalized people to get free software, and also with that make some income to help. So in the next four to five years, I want to help ICT development in Ghana and become an incubation hub for Forge, Debian, Arduino, and Android. And also become a relevant or reliable source in Ghana, Africa, help train talented youth. Um, so want to master Forge, master Debian from here, take Debian back to Ghana, do open forums on campuses. I just completed computer engineering from university, so I can get a lot of university students come together and introduce them to free software, especially Debian from here. And the time is now. Thank you. Thank you. And we've got Jeremy talking about saving babies. So, um, continuing on. Okay. Um, no. My preparation is I sent an email saying I would like to do a lightning talk. Um, okay, so continuing on the theme of helping people in Africa, um, I work for the Precult Foundation, and it would be useful to have a slide just to show you how to um, spell that. Um, but we don't really help people with software. We um, don't really advertise that we use software to the people we're providing services to. What we do is provide information services and um, work with NGOs and other nonprofits to um, help people in other ways. So one of our big projects is, uh, it's called Mom Connect. It's uh, in partnership with the South African Department of Health and a whole bunch of other organizations who I don't really know because I'm not working directly on the project. And it uh, registers pregnant women all over the country. It provides uh, weekly or twice weekly information messages about the state of their pregnancy. It allows feedback. Um, so if they're having any problems, they can talk to a medical professional. Uh, it's integrated with um, the various clinic medical information systems. So. Uh, you get information that is relevant directly to you and your pregnancy, or maybe your friend or family's uh, pregnancy, because often the person who is having the baby is not actually able to be involved in the, uh, or doesn't have a cell phone or something. Most of this is uh, mobile phone based, because that is the communications technology that is available to people in Africa. Um, a lot of people have never used a computer. Um, yeah, um, This particular project has measurably saved babies. Um, there's been several kind of large problems with uh, the maternal health uh, sector that have been picked up by this uh, kind of uh, tight feedback loop and um, the people who are receiving the services being able to directly uh, comment or complain or ask questions about things that otherwise they wouldn't be able to do because there's just nobody to ask. Um, we are, I believe, rolling this out in several other countries as well. Um, one of them is very interesting in that the literacy rate is very low, so we need some kind of voice-based solution instead of text messages which is 
an exciting challenge. Um, traditionally, uh, one of our other um, areas where we've done a lot of work is uh, youth engagement, um, particularly uh, girls in countries where culturally education for girls is a problem. Um, I know even less about that, except that uh, I have to fix a lot of uh, infrastructure for the people running these services because it's we're using a lot of the new buzzwords, and um, it's not always that reliable. Um, looking at our website, there are a whole lot of other things, but those are the two, the two big ones, and all the software we write is open source and free software. Um, in fact, in the past six months, I have contributed to two private repositories, and those are configuration management repositories with credentials in them. Everything else is open, freely available. And um, we're always interested in working with people who want to help people. That's it for me. Any questions? Oh, uh, spell the name of the organization, P-R-A-E-K-E-L-T, um, dot org. Uh, there isn't chalk, so I can't write it down. But if you search for some variant of that, and um, in fact, one of our big problems... Okay. Uh, you can also search for VUMI, V-U-M-I, which is our big messaging system. That'll get to us. Um. Um, you talked about people having low literacy rates and uh, trying to maybe get ready or some way to communicate with them. Have you tried visual uh, communication? So the question is low literacy and um, audio stuff rather than visual, um, I believe. Uh, the problem is still that our way to access people is um, very basic mobile phones. So we're limited to the functionality of a cheap GSM handset, which is basically text and voice calls. Um, so that's our reason for that. We are looking at other technologies, and cheap feature phones are starting to get to the point where they're um, almost useful, so maybe in five years that will change. Thank you. Okay, we've got a couple of last minute uh, sign ups. Vagrant, you're next. not yet too late. You can totally still sign up. People are doing so, in fact. I'm going to give a talk about anti-social social networking. Ooh, networking. There we go. Um, some of you will probably be familiar with some of these anti-social social networking uh, services I use. Um, I don't use Facebook. Uh, I don't use uh, Twitter. 
I, I, you know, I probably do know how to spell them, but I'm being too lazy to bother. Um, I don't use any of these services because I have some awesome services, one of which is uh, uh, the PGP Web of Trust. Why is the PGP Web of Trust antisocial? Well, if you talk to the average person, they're going to look at you and squint and go, why do you need to encrypt messages? Why do you need to make sure this message really came from this other person? So it's kind of, many people would kind of think the level of paranoia in our PGP Web of Trust is uh, a little antisocial. I personally think it's very positively social and uh, more people should get into it, but it's kind of a mess and kind of hard and so, eh, yeah, probably not the most social activity. I mean, it is social for the right people. Um, <laughs> another system I tend to engage in pretty regularly is bugs.debian.org. This is a system in which people incessantly complain about all sorts of problems. You know, that's not really the best way to win friends and uh, make all sorts of, uh, uh, you know, uh, you, you complain about this is broken, that's broken, this other thing. I wish it would do this, you know. That's not really a good way to make friends. Um, so the next thing I'm going to uh, talk or, or maybe even in a sense demonstrate about is uh, something maybe many of you haven't really done. <laughs> and this is uh, one of my other primary social activities. Um, it pretty much involves people coming at you and then you throw them or they throw you or you like put them in an awkward situation with their wrists or their arms or sometimes we even like uh, hit each other with sticks. Um, let's see, maybe that's like somewhere around here. Uh, this is generally not considered a social thing to do, but uh, <laughs> instead, uh, I, I find it's really fun. Um, you fly through the air, you know, people swing at you with a stick, you throw them, it's the best thing ever. Um, but again, it's not exactly your typical social... Uh, so, so what makes antisocial social networking social? Uh, well, I think the primary thing is consent. Uh, you agree to engage in this whole process. You're, you're, you're part of this, this fun, uh, exciting thing, and both of you kind of know what you're getting into. I mean, with bugs.debian.org, maybe less so, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, like these things are all about consent. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's basically what I figured I'd talk about. Any questions? <laughs> So about that video you were showing, yeah. was that the real fight or were you just like dancing or you know, <laughs> ma making it up? Uh, so Aikido is uh, uh, Aikido's kind of uh, yes and no. <laughs> um, in general, you're trying not to resist too much, uh, but you're also giving enough energy that the person has something to work with. Um, but you also don't want to resist too much because you might actually hurt yourself. So you're putting people in situations where it might be awkward and the best thing to do is just to go with the flow. All right. Oh, more questions. Maybe I should have left the video running, huh? Uh, sorry for the video. What bug you were fixing? Um, well, I was fixing my lack of the, the traditional Japanese hakama. I wasn't able to wear them at the time, but then after that they made me wear them and I trip all over them and stuff, which is also kind of awkward, awkward because, you know, wearing clothes that make you trip tends to be uh, not very social. Anything else? All right. All right. Thank you. Next up is Benel, who will talk about an as yet unidentified subject. <laughs> oh, she will be talking about Shack Labs, which is a kind of
Rita. I'm ready. Okay. I think I'm ready. Yes. Okay. So, hi, everyone. I've been meaning to talk about this for a while, but organizing DevConf keeps getting in the way. Sorry. I want to talk to you about Shack Labs today, which is this little hack labby thing that I'm figuring out what to do. Um, and I just knocked this together right now. So, I'm just going to do it through four questions. Why do I want to do this, whatever this is? <coughs> what am I planning to do? What have I learned so far? And where to from here? So the reason why I want to do this is frustration. <laughs> I'm a biologist, a bioprocess engineer, and I'm stuck with what's available. I think a lot of us like brewing beer in our free time. And why I love Mark Tomorshausen's um, brewery in Hunenklip is that he runs his brewery on Linux. So I was like, okay, this is totally possible to control a process in a way that is not insanely expensive like the pharmaceutical industry does, which is my background, but still get cool stuff done. So I was like, okay, what we want to do is called wastewater biorefineries. We're basically retrieving nutrients from the water and making valuable stuff from them. But in short, what I'm trying to do is hacking shit. <laughs> And I'm sorry if that offends anyone. Um, in short, that is, we need three things. At the most basic level, process monitoring. Just want to see what's going on there. That exists to an extent, but only in the most basic parameters. You can't tell exactly what's going on there. Then you want to analyze what that does over time. Is it good? Is it bad? How does it change? And then ultimately control the process to do, make it do what you want to do through some sort of open source hardware. So what I'm planning to do in Shack Labs is have a space in my house, and I literally sold my house and designed a new one to fit with the workshop requirements, which is also now being built while I was organizing a conference, which is just dumb. But anyway, um, and then bring a group of makers and hobbyists, and both from a professional level um, and volunteer level and school-going level, whatever, to interact in a supported, but importantly, a targeted project based system because if you just tell people to do stuff somehow it just doesn't it never works you actually need to give a bit of a guidance to that i do have official collaboration with some universities some industry bodies especially in the wastewater area and in industry um, but i also want to improve that which was my main reason for being involved in depconf and less official collaboration which is basically if you like being involved come join us and as I said, this, this is not a big thing yet. Maybe it will come, become so, but it's happening in my house. I didn't have time to include pictures. The great news um, is what, that I, what have I learned so far? Um, this project exists as an idea for about four years now, but I only really started working on it during last year's DepConf. It was my DepConf project. I hope to have it up and running by this year, but that didn't quite happen. Um, but what I have found out from working with people is that there is a clear need, um, which is great because it means that my chances for success improves. What I also learned, um, especially from this year's DebConf, is that things are easier than I thought, that I don't actually need something as complicated as an Arduino to do a lot of these things, um, which I am very intimidated by stuff. Um, so it's great that it's really simple. So where to from here? Um, at last year's DebConf, we started the project called the Show Me Box Project. Um, with Jonas, Graham, Chris, and Siri. Uh, we were hoping to have it working at this conference thing. It, it works, but not in a way that we could present it as a project. We're hoping to do that as a targeted project next year. Um, Andy told me about his open laptop story, and he's also passionate about koi fish, so I'm hoping to work with him. And then the prototypes that I'm currently working on is called the Smart Wetlands Project, and I'm planning to go into mushrooms as well. Sort of do what um, Mark did with the brewery, but with... Wet, uh, with mushrooms. Um, just an, uh, this is our, our university. This is what the probes look like. If you're interested, you can come chat to me afterwards. Um, and this is what the wetlands look like in my swimming pool, or well, in Graham's swimming pool, actually, at the moment. And that's me. Thank you. Next up is... well. Sorry, time. Next up is Malaga. We we're having we have signups. This is great.
Okay, I don't have slides. I'm awfully unprepared. But I want to talk about a subject that I have recently found uh, very interesting. So first, uh, raise your hand if you think that the intelligence you were born with is the one that you will have all your life. The intelligence. Like, if you think you were born smart, nobody raises their hand. I know they kind of think that they feel this way, but you're ashamed of feeling this way. So, okay, I will not call out in raising your hands for intelligence. How about sports ability? Raise your hand if you think that you were not born ability, like with sports ability, and so you will always be bad at it. Nobody raises their hands. I know you feel this way, but you feel like intimidated by the question. Okay, I will not ask any more questions. So, um, there's, a, there's a book called The Growth Mindset, and it postulates there are two mindsets. The fixed mindset is the mindset where you think that you were either born smart or not, or born talented for music, or talented for sport, or talented for whatever you want, like for programming. You were born talented for programming or not. And then that's it, right? That's fixed mindset. And so if you are in that fixed mindset, and it doesn't need to be that you're 100% of the time in that mindset, but when you are in that mindset, you feel like if you make any mistakes, if you like ask a dumb question, then this is showing that you were actually born dumb, that all this time you've been living like you were born smart, but actually that wasn't true, you were born dumb, right? Because it's this like how we were born thing. And this isn't like in the back of our minds. Even if we don't really think this is true, it's there in the back of our minds. And then the growth mindset is all about learning and all about getting better and about effort. So it's a mindset where if you make a mistake, there's nothing wrong with it. You just learn from your mistake and you get better for the next time. And so if you ask a dumb question, even if the question was actually dumb, it doesn't matter because you learn for the next time. And the, the thing with the fixed mindset is that it holds us back. So whenever we feel like, I will not do this, I will not ask this, I will not take this challenge because it may show that I wasn't actually as smart as everyone else thinks I am. And it may show that I wasn't really born as smart as I wanted to. Uh, like it's holding us back, right? It's not letting us get better. And when we instead get into the mindset of like, I can make mistakes, it doesn't matter because I will learn from my mistakes. And I can be surrounded by people that are super smart and super talented and it doesn't make me uh, be less smart. I can learn from them and be, become as good as they are in whatever they are doing, um, regardless of like born talent, because the born talent doesn't matter. And what matters is the effort that we put into becoming better every day at whatever it is we are doing, right? It doesn't matter if it's programming, if it's teaching, if it's running uh, marathons, we can always become better at whatever we are doing. So that's basically it. So whenever you feel like you're holding yourself back because of uh, showing that you're not as good as you are supposed to be or whatever, just try to think, okay, this is the fixed mindset. It's holding me back. I can learn from my mistakes. I can become better and it doesn't matter. Sam has a question. I, I'm sorry for, I guess this isn't really so much a question, but is it, I'm almost sitting here crying because like looking at the last two talks, this is such an awesome community where basically we can have people who are like, I really want to fix important world problems. And if you haven't thought about how big of a problem dealing with wastewater and the fact that we don't actually get nutrients out of it and cycle them back into the system is, take, it, take 10, 15 minutes and think about that and, and study a little bit about how that all works. It's really kind of scary. 
And but then to also have a community where we can sit here and say, we're going to help each other grow, and we're going to help each other get out of that fixed mindset. This is more than just software. This is changing the world. Thank you both for reminding us of that. We've got one more from Neil and Marais. I don't know the subject, but he's about to tell you. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to need to clone your desktop or activate. How much time do we have, man? Hi. Okay. So this is a this is an X-ray of the cervical spine, which in other words means your neck. So this isn't actually an X-ray of my cervical spine. I hope to show you mine, but I couldn't find it in time. But so now you're probably wondering why do I have an X-ray of my cervical spine? Who wants to guess? I had neck pain, right? I, my neck hurt. That happens to a lot of the software and technology guys. We sit at our computer hunched over the whole day. We have bad posture. We don't do exercise. Blah blah blah, and it can really um, can really mess you up. Okay, so some people say the solution is better ergonomics. You should get a workstation. You might end up with something ridiculous like this. And, well, that probably is an easier way, potentially, to sit and work and less effort in your body. But um, something which I, I got to learn at great personal cost is that it doesn't actually matter how good your workstation is. If you're not using your body right, you're going to ruin it. So... Actually, if you are sitting in a typical hunched over posture with your neck like this, that's all bad, right? But it's not nearly as bad as being upright and uh, stressed or not relaxed. Anything that you do, if you do it with relaxation, you put less stress in your body and you cause less damage and you can maintain it for longer. But these, why, why do we get so stressed? It's bad habits. They build up over time. It's... Um, some of it actually come from stress. So I actually trace it back to, I did a PhD, a very dumb idea. Took a year longer than expected. I didn't have money. And towards the end of my PhD, I couldn't actually successfully swallow. I had to, I was that tense. And then I finished my PhD and uh, you know, the review panel gave me very nice comments and I thought, okay, well, it was all worthwhile. And uh, I relaxed a bit, but I didn't quite relax. Then I got working and after a while, I, could, I got so stressed, I, well, my body just got so stiff, I could hardly breathe. And then I did what most people do is I go to physiotherapists 
and they they can help you a bit. They can relieve a, the, the, uh, you know, they can relieve a acute strain. And then they gave me some exercises, and I did them religiously. And I actually got quite somewhat buff. My girlfriend was very impressed, but I was uh, I was still in pain. It didn't it didn't help. It helped a bit, but didn't work. But what worked in my body, that's like a joke, and what, worked, what works on my machine, in case you didn't pick that up. Um, so there's this thing called the Alexander Technique, which is not that well known, um, but it's a, it's a technique where people literally teach you how to use your body, right? Now, that might sound silly, but the problem is we spend a lot of time using computers, and we actually, it's not a, it's not a physically stressful task, you know, you're not lifting anything heavier than your finger. So especially when you're young and strong and nothing matters, you don't bother about doing it right because you don't have to because even if you're sitting in a bad position, you can do it for a while, but then you get a bit older or you get some stress in your life and then it's a problem. So what happens in the Alexander Technique is you actually have an instructor and they use extensively what they call the hands-on technique. So they're not actually pushing you hard at all. They really just touch you very lightly, but they guide your body in such a way that you literally practice standing up, sitting down, lying, while using your body in a good way. And a very important thing is it's relaxation first. And I, I learned the importance of this because when I went to my first, I don't call it therapy, they call it lessons, almost like music lessons, it's just body lessons. So when I attended my first Alexander class, I walked in with a very stiff neck and a very hurty body and there are other ways to learn your body, how to use your body, but most of them require you to be quite active. And if you're really hurting, it's very hard to start. You can do Pilates or Tai Chi or something like that, but it's always you find yourself in a situation where you're hurting right now and you don't know how to make it better. And I walked out of the lesson and the pain was gone. Oh, I forgot to make the important point on this x-ray, which would have been mine. The doctor wrote the comments which basically said the neck is perfect, there's nothing wrong with it. So even though there was physically nothing wrong with me, because I was using my body incorrectly, um, I had pain. And I found that this technique helped me a lot, and it might help you too if you have similar issues. So you can check. It's a real thing. It is on Wikipedia. Therefore, it must exist. Thank you. may or may not be related, but if you use multifocal glasses, there's a small spot where you can focus, so you tend to pull your neck back. If you then use glasses that um, focus sort of on three meters, but then it lifts just the middle of your sight to your computer terminal, it brings your neck forward. And that helps a lot in my case. I mean, I actually... I looked all that stuff up and I did, went to a lot of effort to arrange the ergonomics of my desk. And, and the thing is, that helps, but it doesn't help you if you're still using your body of tension. So. Okay, so that's going for. We have one more down the stall. Down the stall, Oh, you see, you see the desktop, but can you let me try another thing? Uh, as an introduction, I can say um, I'm sorry for those that were ye here last year because that just happens to be the same talk, but um, refreshed. Do we have slides now? I've made it only one screen. Okay, so um, 
but uh, you don't see my slides. <laughs> anyway, um, the idea was um, going from Debian printing to printing Debian. Uh, why me? I happen to be the maintainer of the Debian printing stack, and sometimes I have uh, weird ideas. Oh, I can do that. Wow. That works. Um, I have a dream. What we do is great. Debian is one of the largest automated free software collection I've built. Uh, we have 175 gigabytes and that big number of lines of source code uh, in the stable release and probably 20% more for the next stable release. Source code is immaterial. What about crystallizing this heritage into the physical world? But there was Software Heritage uh, project announced uh, this year. Um, I kind of consider that a natural following of the printing Debian project, right? Um, but Software Heritage, if you have followed their talk, um, they're not ready for the world apocalypse. They even acknowledge that. So um, let's print the Debian source code. Easy, right? Um, but you, you should think of this as an art project. Uh, it's really the f um, an idea to, to physicalize what we do that is totally immaterial as something physical um, that could be the digital heritage for humanity. But, well, there are some challenges. The first is typesetting 175 gigabytes of source code. You could not really do it by hand, right? We have uh, non-text plane files, images, sounds, etc. So what can you do about that? And well, if you want to do all of that in one second PDF, <coughs> well, if you can do that, talk to me. Um, actually, there is a precedent there. Wikipedia actually typesetted the English version, which was um, 50 gigabytes of text, 5 million pages. It made 7,000 volumes, of which the 200 late last ones were only contributors. And you can actually buy it. They uploaded the giant PDF to lulu.com, and if you have a s half million dollars to spare, you can get Wikipedia English at home. But uh, probably not, <laughs> um, because that would be so much more. Um, just as a, an attempt as, and as an update for last year's exact same talk, I just typesetted the CUPS Debian package out of fun. <laughs> Problem is, and I didn't realize it was that much, actually. It was really interesting to try. Point is, the changelog change is 127 A4 pages. <laughs> That doesn't make a very practical use of paper, right? But, and the other problem is that the stupid script failed after 2,500 2, pages. And it was probably only 25% through the source code. Th and that's just for one single source package in Debian. So actually, I think my numbers I had, I had after that, the amount of paper that is needed, so there's some questions to be solved to format. Using recycled paper is probably a smart way, but if we want long-term storage, then you might want to, to use Chinese ink and good, pa good quality paper. Um, the ecology of uh, storing that many trees under some source code form in some library for no one to ever go through it and read it is something to be considered. So maybe only having one of these uh, would be enough. And printing this, actually, if, even if you had a printer available, that would resists that load testing, uh, you can probably get down to two cents per A4 pages. Um, that means printing a third of cups actually costs $50-ish. 50, $50 so yeah, what about the rest of Debian? And then how do you do bookbinding? How many volumes would that be? Um, actually, last year, Bdale asked, told me I should talk to HP about that. Apparently, they do printers. Um, and we could crowd print that, because a single printer would probably never finish the source code before dying itself. Maybe out of boredness, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, then if ever we could ge uh, generate the giant PDF, we could upload it to lulu.com, but I'm not sure they can actually uh, withstand uh, such a big PDF, if ever we could be able to produce it. And then where we could host that copy, um, we could have the. Um, a museum agreed to have that, maybe have it uh, as an art e exhibition, uh, would, which could have maybe a printer that prints everything that passes through new, for example. That would make the printer run for quite some time. Uh, well, no, not at my place. Thank you very much. Uh, finances, and I'll skip to that because we are 
soon at the end, the one idea to materialize this book of Debian would be to have a web service that would say, I enter in the library, I pick one volume random, and I open it at a random, random page, but we could have that, that online. So we could have a web version with infinite up-down scrolling, for example, webby pe people know how to do that. Uh, it could be about the printing process, and of course I need help, maybe just starting by buying enough paper, uh, <laughs> and that's it. Thank you for your attention. Of course, there is an alias project page. <laughs> we have $300,000 on Doyan money. I think we can spare some of that on for this project. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> OK, everybody, thank you all for coming. Um, thank you especially to the late sign-ups. And don't forget, there are live demos tomorrow. Same place, same channel, same time. Okay, see you later. Bye.